During the Second World War, the decision was made to locate Britain's principal civil airport at Heathrow. Heathrow had been a small hamlet along a minor country lane called Heathrow Road, in the ancient parish of Harmonsworth, Middlesex. Heathrow's buildings and all associated holdings were demolished in 1944 for the construction of the airport. In this video we're going to take a tour of the old Heathrow hamlet at the time of the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939 and 1940. We'll be using an old 1939 and 1940 map. The photos and video material you'll see here date from that time. You'll see scenes from a lost hamlet. A lot of the following material is based on work by a local historian called Philip Sherwood. We thank him for the inspiration. As we said, we'll be using a 1939 map in our travels. It's colour-coded, arable fields are in yellow, pasture is green, and you'll see orchards and market gardens and more. The photographs and video we'll use here depict the Heathrow area before the coming of the bulldozer. The name Heathrow described its layout. A row of houses on a lane by a heath. Now in making this video we have to get our bearings a bit. The Bath Road, the A4, runs east-west across the northern end of the modern Heathrow Airport. And there's a modern entrance into the airport at a road called Neen Road. It's here, just east of what used to be called the Concord Roundabout. Although this landscape is utterly changed from before, there is still a pub here called the Three Magpies. And we'll be focusing on that pub, so you can get some bearings. Let's have a look at the Magpies on a series of maps. You'll notice that along with a red dot, we've marked out a yellow line. We'll explain that next. Heathrow Road ran south from the Bath Road at the Three Magpies pub and, after a mile, turned west. After another mile, the 1939 traveller could follow another road, Tithebarn Road, back north to the Bath Road. We'll follow this route, a rather extended crescent. Heathrow Road marked a boundary. Most of the area to the south and east originally formed the edge of Hounslow Heath and the area to the north and west was originally one of the open fields of the parish and was known as Heathrow Field. In 1819 Heathrow Field was split into individual fields and many of the buildings and farms arrived to exploit the newly available land. So let's go back in time. The Magpies was a cluster of houses at the junction of the Bath Road and Heathrow Road. It's still here at the northern entrance road into the airport but nobody really knows it by its former name. It was called the Magpies as it had two pubs called after that particular bird. The Three Magpies and the Old Magpies. The road layout is somewhat different now but back in 1939 Heathrow Road the road we'll virtually walk along, led south from the Bath Road corner where the three magpies stood. If we turned down Heathrow Road here, we would have passed a row of houses, Doghurst Cottages, on the eastern side as we walked along. These cottages weren't so old, they were built around 1900. Photographs show them as brick-built two-storey houses with slate roofs. Behind Dorcos Cottages was King's Arbour. This was a small orchard set up before the 19th century. Orchards were a major agricultural activity in this area. In 1784, within this particular orchard, General William Roy mapped one end of the first baseline 
for measuring the distance between the Paris Observatory and the Greenwich Observatory. It was the first precise distance survey in Britain. General Roy chose this orchard for his line as it was near flat, near Hounslow Heath Barracks and only about 15 miles from the Royal Observatory. The other, southern end of the line was the Hampton Poor House. Both ends of the survey were marked by vertical wooden pipes which could support flagstaffs. The first farmhouse going south along Heathrow Road was a rather undistinguished one on the east known as Bathurst. In the 1930s a Mr William Howell was recorded as living there. But much more interesting was some distance behind Bathurst. There was a Neolithic Iron Age settlement called Caesar's Camp. Alas, because they built the airport, all evidence of this was destroyed in 1944, despite a hurried archaeological survey. Heathrow Road was renowned for being a riot of wildflowers in the springtime. These included red and white campion, ragged robin, harebells, oxide daisies, willow herb and yellow iris beside the numerous ponds along the road. A little further along on the west side of Heathrow Road was one of the largest farmhouses along it, known as Heathrow Hall. By the late 19th century, the hamlet of Heathrow had developed three main agricultural settlement clusters, with orchards and fields worked by teams of labourers. These three were Heathrow Hall, Perrott's Farm and Perry Oaks. Heathrow Hall was an attractive 18th century building, occupied by one of several branches of the Philp family, who farmed extensively in this area. The farmhouse adjoined a typical English farmyard with sheep, pigs, cattle and many old barns. In 1939, Frederick Philp was recorded as living at Heathrow Hall. Almost opposite Heathrow Hall on the east side of the road was a large pond, which had probably started life as a gravel pit. This pond was surrounded by trees and reeds and had a rich variety of wildlife including kingfishers looking for fish. In 1939, the Heathrow Brick Company applied to His Majesty's Land Registry to register this land. A very short-lived brickworks was thus established here. Palmer's Farm was about a quarter of a mile past the pond on the west side of the road. It was an early 17th century farmhouse. Tell you what, let's take a little diversion into one of the fields of Palmer's Farm. We'll go for a little walk. Through this gate? Yeah, into this yard. And we'll hop over this and walk over here. Just after passing Palmer's Farm, there was a fork in the road called Wheatcut Corner. We can see another road heading southeast from this corner, so let's take a brief foray along this other road. It's called Cain's Lane. The lane led as far as East Bedfont, and it was dead straight, having been laid out across the heath by the Enclosure Commissioners in 1819. Shortly after 1819, a new row of farms was set up on this new farmland along both sides of Cain's Lane. The first thing we'd reach on the east side of Cain's Lane were two 20th century farmhouses. These were called Shrub End and Croft House. They belonged to the Wild family, whose family had also been farming in the parish for more than 300 years, just like the Philps and on a corner of their farm, and adjoining the road, 
was a corrugated iron mission hall, which had been erected in the early 20th century. Opened in 1929, the ferry airfield was a little further along on the west side. We'll return to this story later and we'll continue along the lane. By the early 1900s, Charles Glenny lived at Cain's farm, keeping a dairy herd of some 20 cows. By the early 1930s, a certain Mrs Wardell lived at the farm, but the farm was very much a going concern in the dairy industry. Opposite Cain's farm, Heathrow House had been built in the 18th century, and it preceded the date of the lane. By 1872, a market gardener was living at Heathrow House, and it's thus likely that house was still being used as a farmhouse at the outbreak of the Second World War. Cain's Lane continued on until it crossed, in about half a mile, the Great South West Road. This main road had been constructed as a bypass to the old Staines Road in 1925. The part of Cain's Lane beyond the Great South West Road is still outside the boundaries of the airport and a small length of its southeast end still exists. We will backtrack onto Wheat Cut Corner and go back onto Heathrow Road. To its north at this point was Perrot's farm. By 1819 this farm was in the ownership of Martha Perrot, hence the name. A half-timbered frontage was a feature of the farm buildings, set back about 150 feet from the road. In its final years, Perrot's farm wasn't independent, and Heathrow Farm used its buildings. About 200 yards along Heathrow Road from its junction with Keynes Lane, and on its north side, was Heathrow's only pub, the Plough and Harrow. It was a small building of no great distinction, to be honest, dating from the mid-19th century. Edgar Charles Basham, was the name of the final publican at the time of the Second World War. At the same time, a local trade directory listed George Dance as living in a small house directly opposite the pub. And behind his house was Wheat Cut Field, a square area of land. When it had been an orchard, it belonged to Perrot's farm, but it eventually passed on to the Philp family. In 1938, during the Munich crisis, the Wild family took possession of the field, grubbed out the orchard and planted vegetables on the land. Heathrow Road now begins to run into the heart of Heathrow Hamlet itself. There were some buildings after the pub. Although most of the agricultural land in West Middlesex was in use for market gardening, mixed farming was also practised at Heathrow. This made living there more attractive than the rest of the locality. Mixed farming, unlike market gardening, could in the 1930s exist quite happily with trees and hedgerows. Heathrow Farm, the next main building, lay on the north side of Heathrow Road. It grew vegetables and cereals. The Curtis family were the final farmers at Heathrow Farm and it dated from before the 1819 enclosures. Soon after passing Heathrow Farm, there was a T-junction along Heathrow Road where High Tree Lane branched off to the left. This was another of the Enclosure Commissioner's 1819 roads, leading in a straight line this time to West Bedfont. And we'll just briefly nip half a mile along High Tree Lane here to a ford marked on maps as Goathouse Tree Ford. This was where the road crossed the Duke of Northumberland's River. The Duke of Northumberland's River had been constructed in the mid-16th century. It was designed to increase the flow driving Isleworth Mill and to provide water to Sion House. When construction of the airport began in 1944, it was diverted to a more southerly route for about two miles of its length. But back in the 1930s, Goathouse Tree Ford was the official name for the crossing Locals, though, called it High Tree River. It was a local beauty spot, quite popular for picnics and where children could safely paddle in the water and fish for sticklebacks. Coming back along High Tree Lane to rejoin Heathrow Road, and going further along Heathrow Road, 
there are quite a few more residential buildings. These house mainly agricultural workers, and in the 1930s, Heathrow's only shop was here. Heathrow had an unusual and continuing agricultural focus being so close to London. The underlying brick earth and gravel made for reliable farming for fruit trees, vegetables and flowers. Often several sorts of fruit were mixed in the orchards where a lot of soft fruit was grown, often under the fruit trees. An author in 1907 reported thousands and thousands of cherry, plum, pear, apple and damson trees. London markets were in easy reach of these perishable cash crops. Produce was taken to Covent Garden Market, 14 miles away, or by smaller growers to Brentford Market. Until motor lorries arrived on the scene, Covent Garden was about six hours away at laden horse and wagon speed. Goods had to set off before 10pm the previous evening to reach the market when it opened at 4am. After the First World War, the amount of fruit growing in the area decreased due to demand for more market gardening land. And by 1939, less than 10% of the orchard area was left. But the area held on to a very old style of mixed farming on the whole. It was continually chosen for the Middlesex area horse-drawn ploughing competitions. This needed land which was under stubble after harvest. The next location along the road was Perry Oaks. This was described as a most handsome red brick Elizabethan farmhouse. Perry Oaks had a gate on the Heathrow Road and also a gate on the Tithe Barn Lane. At the end of its days it was occupied by Sidney Whittington from an old local farming family. It had some old barns, a dovecote and also a duck pond. It was considered the best of the many farmsteads of Heathrow. With land sold by the Whittingtons, the Perry Oaks Sludge Works was opened in 1936 by the Middlesex County Council. This was 200 acres of land occupied by lagoons in which sludge was allowed to settle under gravity. It sounds pretty horrible, but actually it was more attractive than its description. The lagoons only disappeared in the late 1990s when they needed to make way for Heathrow Terminal 5. The works had become a site of some significant scientific importance. A large number of wading birds were being attracted by the lagoons. Back at Perry Oaks Farm, due to its westerly position, it slightly postdated the rest of the Heathrow demolition. It held out until the late 1940s and can be seen in this movie Between the New Runways. But our old friend Heathrow Road ends here. Oaks Road leads south and Tithe Barn Lane leads north. We'll follow the latter now. Tithe Barn Lane got its name from a barn halfway along its western side. This was reputedly a reconstruction of the northern wing of the Great Barn of Harmonsworth. Further north, the area at the junction of Tithe Barn Lane and the Bath Road was known as Shepherd's Pool. The pool was a large pond completely surrounded by trees. It probably had started life as a gravel pit, but had become naturalised over 150 years. And so we rejoined the Bath Road midway between two pubs. The Three Magpies, where we were earlier, and the Peggy Bedford. So what happened to the hamlet of Heathrow? Well, we need to retrace our steps to Ferry Aviation's Great West Aerodrome on Keynes Lane. Since 1915, Ferry Aviation had been flight testing aircraft. This was then a new invention. They'd been testing at Northolt Aerodrome. The aircraft were designed and manufactured at their factory in North Hyde Road in Hayes. In 1928, the Air Ministry said, you have to leave, stop using North Holt. Ferry's chief test pilot was a chap called Norman Macmillan. 
He recalled an earlier false landing and takeoff he'd made at Heathrow in 1925. He remembered how flat the land was and recommended the area as perhaps suitable for an aerodrome. He flew some aerial surveys of the site and convinced his bosses to move here. And indeed, Fairy Aviation moved on the 4th of March 1929. The company originally bought 71 acres. Later purchases gradually enlarged the aerodrome to about 240 acres. The site was about three miles by road from Hayes and it was declared operational in June 1930. That year a hangar was built. In time the airfield got called the Great West Aerodrome. The Second World War started and in 1943 the Air Ministry secretly developed plans to requisition the airfield under the Defence of the Rail Mac 1939. The plans were stated as suiting the needs of long-range bombers. But the plans were actually based on confidential recommendations for a new international airport for London, replacing Croydon. The project was headed by Harold Balfour. He kept the true nature of it hidden from Parliament. Ferry Aviation had, also in 1943, purchased 10 more acres of land to add to the airfield. It intended to relocate its production facilities from Hayes. But soon they learnt of the plans. The wartime legislation provided no obligation to pay compensation to Ferry, and indeed it didn't at the time. And the whole area, from the Magpies to Heathrow Farm to Perry Oaks, down Cain's Lane to the Great South West Road. The whole area was served with eviction notices in May 1944. It was wartime. Dissent was frowned upon. It was wartime, there was no need for any public inquiries. And within a year, everything had been demolished and tarmacked over. The home location of generations disappeared. Caesar's camp, which had been there since the Iron Age, ended up under a runway. Some of the most fertile land in the London area went under concrete. By the end of the war, the official plans had already changed from wartime military use, which had not been honest, to overt development into an international airport. On the 31st of May 1946, the newly named London Airport was officially opened for commercial operations. Ferry's 1930 hangar was used as the airport's fire station. It was finally demolished. The development of the airport destroyed the long-lasting north-south road links between Harmonsworth and Stanwell, for instance, between Longford and East Bedfont. The large expanse of the airport created a complete barrier. Now there's little sense of a shared community interest between the villages to the north and the villages to the south. And the very reason for abandoning Croydon Airport, being surrounded by housing, is now very similarly true of Heathrow. But it's not our place in the video to comment on the airport's politics. It's here. It's London's airport. It's Heathrow.